Good evening. I'm Gregory Appling, member of the Summerland Trust Board of Directors. Welcome to the language of the land, vernal pools of the Santa Rosa Plain. This presentation is being interpreted in Spanish. If you click on the world icon at the bottom right of your screen to access it, if you're on a phone, click on the three dots and choose your language. Hola, buenas noches. Si desean escuchar esta reunión en español, como lo mencionó recién Gregory, eh, lo pueden hacer seleccionando el idioma de preferencia ahora en un ratito. Y mi nombre es Mariana Rivarola, yo voy a estar traduciendo para ustedes. Thank you, Gregory. The presentation is scheduled for about an hour, which will be followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. You can submit your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A part. Sonoma Land Trust is a local nonprofit that protects land in Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. We've been doing this work since 1976 and have protected over 56,000 acres in our county so far. We accomplish our work through the generosity of our members and contributors. So thanks to all of you out there who are helping us protect beautiful Sonoma County for future generations. As we pursue our mission of conserv conserving land in Sonoma County, we recognize that we stand upon the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous pe peoples. We honor their knowledge, care, and stewardship of this special place across the ages and acknowledge the deep and lasting damage that colonization has inflicted on them. We embrace our responsibility to learn from and protect their culture and traditional connections to the land. Victoria Brunel, an MS candidate at Sonoma State University, is studying the movement patterns of the California tiger salamanders during their annual breeding migration on the Santa Rosa Plain. She has been the lead researcher at a local California tiger salamander preserve in Santa Rosa for the last two years and a participant there for the last four years. While working on her research, she also works for Swaim Biological Inc., a small women owned environmental consulting company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. She is the current graduate assistant for Sonoma State University's Naturalist Program at Fairfield Osborne Preserve and the assistant curator at Sonoma State's Vertebrate Museum. She has a wide array of experience working with California native herpetofauna using various trapping techniques, visual surveys, telemetry, and pool sampling. Candace Gilmore, MS, studied flower visiting insects that frequent the endangered vernal pool plants, Sonoma Sunshine, Sebastopol Metaphoma, and Burke's Goldfields for her master's thesis. She currently works as a lab technician at Sonoma State University and volunteers in the community doing outreach on topics such as habitat gardening, native plants, as host for insects, and outdoor education. She is past president of the Pacific Coast Etymological Society and serves as a secretary on the board of directors for a local environmental nonprofit conservation works. Ladies and gentlemen, Victoria Brunel and Candace Gilmore. Thank you for that, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for that introduction, Gregory. Um, I'm gonna get started with our presentation. Excuse me for a second. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to our talk about vernal pools of the Santa Rosa Plain. So when I say vernal pools, what, is, what does that mean? So I'm referring to a type of seasonal wetland where there is an underlying hard pan or clay pan that's underneath the soil so that when rain falls down, it can't soak all the way through. It's, it there becomes a perched water table. And so in areas where the ground goes up and down a little bit in the dips, that's where the water collects. 
Um, these type of vernal pools happen in Mediterranean climates where it's rainy and cool in the winter time and then hot and dry in summer. Um, so these are seasonal wetlands. They're flooded during winter and spring. And because of this um, sort of biphasic, like amphibious habitat where it's flooded in winter and then dry in summer, there are plants and animals that can cope with this, you know, changing um, seasonal habitat. And so vernal pools have become um, what they call islands of endemism. Uh, so endemic means they occur only in this type of habitat. So there's a lot of endemic flora and fauna that occur in vernal pools. <clears throat> so for an example, um, this is the same area in winter. Uh, during the wet phase, there's a lot of water that's collected at the surface. And so there's the nice a uh, nice wetland there. And as it water's evaporating through spring, um, plants that have started growing under the water are coming up and coming into flower. So it moves into the flowering phase. The flowers create seeds and then dry up. They're annual plants. And so in the summer, it's completely dry. And so there's moves to the dry phase. Um, so because of this, there's specialized plants that are adapted to this type of life cycle. Some of the common examples are vernal pool semaphore grass. So they have these really nice um, purple tassels that hang down. They, they can grow up out of the water and then the continue growing. Um, some other common plants are like succulent owl clover and also calico flower, which is also called downingia. The Santa Rosa Plain is an area that has uh, historically has a lot of vernal pools. And what I mean by that, it's the sort of the flatlands that um, start north of Windsor to the north and Rohnert Park to the south. And then um, Rohnert Park and Santa Rosa to the east and Sebastopol to the west. So this, this entire area is considered the Santa Rosa Plain. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of loss of vernal pools in the Santa Rosa Plain because of urbanization, either building over them or agricultural conversion being turned to vineyards or other fields. Um, and it's estimated that 85% of the original vernal pools have been destroyed. So the ones that are left are pretty precious. <laughs> and um, in addition to natural habitats that are still remaining, there are um, a conservation strategy that has come up in the last 30 years is creating vernal pools um, in conservation or mitigation banks. And so what they do is they find areas of land that have that clay pan that will uh, hold the water. Sculpt, they'll sculpt out vernal pools using earth movers and um, they will move seeds and spores to those to help populate them with the plants and and animals and hopefully, or, you know, uh, the aquatic, the aquatic crustaceans and stuff, and then hope that animals will find their way to the new habitats. Um, sometimes they do this as a way to make up for habitat that's been lost. And other times um, they do it just to try to create more habitat for these plants. So um, three of the plants that are endemic to our area um, that are in endangered because of habitat loss that occur in Santa Rosa are Blenus vermivacari, also called Sonoma Sunshine. And it is blooming from March to about mid-April. Limnanthes vinculans, also called Sebastopol metaphone, blooms from April to mid-May. And Lasthenia burkii, also called Berg's Goldfields, which starts blooming like later April and will go through May. There's a fourth endangered plant that grows only in the Santa Rosa area, and it's only known to exist at one site near the airport. It's called many flowered Navaricia, also called Navaricia leucocepha pelantha. But um, I'm not going to talk about that very much. I don't actually know that much about it other than it's super rare. Um, I want to acknowledge the vernal pool bee researchers who have come before me. There are similar plants that grow in vernal pools in the Central Valley. 
that are in the same genus as the ones we have here. And uh, Dr. Robin Thorpe was a professor at UC Davis for many years, and he studied vernal pool pollinators since the 1960s. And one of his grad students, Joan Leong, she studied specifically pollinators of the uh, Blenosperma, like ones related to Sonoma sunshine, like yellow carpet and some other ones in the Central Valley. And she also did a side project in Santa Rosa in the 90s. And um, I met her at a conference and she came back and we we did a, we tried to like repeat her side project, but she's been, um, both of them have been really helpful to me in my studies. So what they found is that associated with these vernal pool uh, flowers, there are bees that visit them that are in the family called Andrenity. So these are mining bees. They're about two thirds the size of a honeybee. Andrenity is a large family with many species and a lot of them nest in the ground. Um, so they're not like living in a beehive or anything like that. Many of them are oligolectic, which means they're picky about the kind of pollen that they collect. And um, one of the key characters to differentiate them from other families is that on their face, they have two sub antennal sutures. So from the antenna onto their face, there's these little grooves. Um, there's other characteristics you can see with wing venation. Um, there are little, little details that you have to look at a hand lens or microscope to really get clear about. But once you learn to recognize it, from you know specimens, it's easier to see it when it's like flying around in the field. So this word oligolectic, or I you know I mentioned that they're picky eaters, or they're picky about what pollen they collect. Um, oligo means few, and lectic means feeding. That means that they provision their nests with pollen from closely related host plants. So usually plants within the same genus. Um, like for example, the Blenosperma bee collects pollen from Blenosperma flowers. So um, Blenosperma banana, Blenosperma bakeri, um, stuff like that. So they, um, gather, they'll they get nectar from other flowers for energy, but they're gathering pollen, which is really rich in protein to provision their nest cells and that creates food for the next generation. So their uh, emergence when they come out in spring is really synchronized for when their host plant is blooming. You know, when they come out, they wanna have their plant be ready for them so they can get busy gathering pollen and nectar for their nests. And in the meantime, the plant benefits by getting genetic material from its neighbors so it can have, you know, um, outcrossing and have a hardy offspring also. Um, but these can be really sensitive to fragmentation and habitat loss because they're so reliant on particular types of plants. When they come out in the spring, they, they need their plants to be there for them. Um, so these, unlike, you know, honeybees, which have like a queen and workers and everything, these bees are solitary, which means each female makes her own nest. So a little bit about their life cycle. When an adult comes out in the spring and flowers are, flowers are out, she'll be busy like digging, digging little tunnels and gathering pollen and nectar from their flowers, um, bringing it back to the nest and creating a little ball of pollen and nectar, uh, nest provision. Some people, sometimes it's called bee bread, but it's a little ball of pollen and nectar and she'll lay an egg on top of it and then close off that cavity and then do several more cells, sometimes inside tunnels or on top of each other. Um, each female might only get to provision and lay eggs for like 15 to 20 um, cells, you know, in, in the three to six weeks that she's out flying around. So it's um, a lot of parental investment. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so the egg gets laid on the pollen ball, larva will hatch out and it has its food there to eat. And once it eats and grows, then it'll turn into a pupa, kind of like butterfly going into its cocoon. It'll transform from a larva into an adult and then it'll wait underground until it's springtime to emerge um, when the flowers are out. And it's not quite known exactly what is the cue that lets them know that it's time to come out. But there is anecdotal evidence that if it's a really dry year, 
the bees don't come out, they sort of hold over till the next year so that they can come out when there's plenty of flowers around. So um, these maps, I'm gonna show a series of maps and the line on them is, you know, the polygon that's surrounded by the line is the range of the host plant and the little dots are where the oligolectic bee species was found. So the bee that's the specialist on Blenismura flowers is called Andrina blenispermatis. Uh, Robin Thorpe actually described it. He wrote the species description in 1969. Excuse me. And so you can see that Blenisperma exists in a lot of California. And these are the sites that as of 19, I think this paper came out in 1990, um, but these were all the places that it had been found um, in association with its host plant. Some are in, some in the Central Valley, some in Sonoma County. For um, Sebastopol, I mean, excuse me, for meadow foams, for all the limnanthes, the bee that is a specialist on them is called Andrina pulverea. There's also another smaller one called Panergynus occidentalis that use meadow foams or limnanthes plants as their host plant. And there's a lot of different species of meadow foams out there. There's like common meadow foam, Butte County meadow foam, um, and also, you know, Sebastopol meadow foam. And so you can see that there are also a lot of meadow foam bees that have been found throughout the range um, of Northern and Central California. And for Lasthenia, the gold fields, there's quite a few different species of gold fields. We have our, you know, specialized Berks gold fields here in Sonoma County. There's also Lasthenia californica, which is common, or California gold fields that grows in grasslands. And there's other gold fields that grow in serpentine areas. And you can see that this oligolectic bee has been found far and wide across the range of its host plants. And for Downingia, the calico flower, there is a little really small bee that has uh, been shown to be a, um, a pollen specialist that's called Panergynus atricets. And it's, um, it has only been found in a couple places overlapping with its, the range of its host plant. And I actually, when I brought some of my bees to Robin to get identified, he told me that I, I found some of them and I helped him put more dots on his map. So there should be a couple more dots in Sonoma County on that map. Um, so a little bit about my research on the Santa Rosa Plain. I conducted field work um, in the years 2009 to 2011. And I did a lot of work on the ground and then Robin Thorpe at UC Davis helped a lot with confirming my bee identifications. Um, overall, I collected, um, I collected with a net. So I collected about 500 individuals over several sites um, and I ended up finding 31 different species of bees. And then another more passive collecting method is called pan traps, where you have little colored bowls of soapy water. Uh, they're yellow, white, and blue. You set them out in the field and the color kind of attracts insects that are flying through that like to visit flowers and they fall in the water and then you collect them and can, and then take all the bees, put them on pins and see what you find. And I only put those out for one day at each site, but they were, some of them were very effective at collecting. And I had over like 12,000, I mean, excuse me, 1200 individuals. But the interesting thing is I found 62 different species. So that's insects that are flying around the area and not necessarily from the specific host plants. The net collections are a lot more specific to the plant. And then the pan traps are more just general who's flying through the area. But I thought that was pretty cool that just in our little Santa Rosa Plain area in, you know, not even the entire year, just like a couple months, I found 62 different species of bees. Um, one of my research questions on my thesis was looking at whether there was differences between natural vernal pools and constructed vernal pools in the type of pollinators, whether the oligolectic bees were at constructed sites, and then the rate of um, visitation by insects. 
So I spent time like with a quadrat timing for 10 minutes, watching all the insects that came and visited the flowers and, you know, said, um, and counted that over, over times between natural sites and constructed sites to sort of get a comparison to see if there were differences. So I had those observations in addition to the net collecting. Um, the observations were better for general categories of insects because it's hard to tell the difference between species, between these little bees that are flying around real fast. But I had general categories like solitary bee, honey bee, surfed fly, et cetera. So I had, um, yeah, these are kind of the furthest north, kind of around furthest north were in Northwest Santa Rosa. And then the furthest south were, um, that's a little bit north of where Walmart is in Roanoke Park. So kind of covering covering the Santa Rosa Plain area. Uh, quick summary, I found that overall, generally the insect visitation rates in flowers were higher in natural sites than constructed sites, uh, but not for meadow foam. <laughs> I found that the oligolectic bee species were associated with each of, the, each of the plants, like similar how they found it in the Central Valley. I found the oligolectic species for, for all the three different species. Um, there are really high numbers of meadow foam bee. And I think the reason why is because there's also common meadow foam that grows in grasslands. And so it's um, the range of the bee and the amount of food that's available to it is not just restricted to vernal pools, but you know, all over the place. Um, and then I, I also saw that the closer a constructed vernal pool was to a natural population, the more insect visitation was observed. So, um, so actually these bees that work on vernal pool flowers don't live in the water itself. They rely on the plants that live in the water, but I'm gonna switch to talking about more about the animals that actually live in the water of the vernal pools. So during the wet phase, there's a whole host of different invertebrates that spring to life and start taking advantage of that water and growing and, um, one of the more rem remarkable ones is a predaceous diving beetle. So as a larva, um, it's like long and wriggly and it has pretty big mandibles and they, they swim around and hunt, you know, hunt little worms and copepods and everything. And when they turn into adults, they um, have these strong back legs that kick and they can really get around and zip around really well. Um, some other, groups that, uh, some of the bigger groups that are found in vernal pools are fairy shrimp, which uh, they're, they have to complete their life cycle during the wet phase, and then their eggs stay in the dust, um, and they can be completely dried out, and they'll just be dried out during the dry season, and then when the rain comes, they spring back to life, and they, fairy shrimp are known to be, um, they can live in ditches that just get rainwater sometimes. They can be in vernal pools. They're pretty interesting. And um, water mites, if you look in the water and you see like little dots, little red dots just zooming around and you look at them up close, they're, they're mites. They're like, they have eight legs, kind of related to spiders, but they're not scary. They're very cute. And seed shrimp, which are actually a type of crustacean, they're, um, they, look like little seeds or like tiny little clams and there they also have little legs and they can zip around. So all these things that come to life um, provide a lot of food for animals that are passing by, um, birds, amphibians, and other things. And so I'm gonna segue to talking about, um, to Victoria, who's gonna tell you about um, some vernal pool amphibians. Thanks, Candice. Um, so in addition to the many invertebrate species and the unique vernal pool plants, amphibians are another group of organisms that rely on vernal pools. And this is primarily because of their um, biphasic or complex life cycle, similar to in insects. Um, some amphibian species go through a metamorphosis process, which is um, referred to as like their complex or biphasic life cycle. So that just means that there's a sort of split between their life cycle between a terrestrially dominated phase and then an aquatic dominated phase. And during the aquatic phase, um, individuals will come to these 
pools or some sort of some sort of aquatic resource and they will breed and lay eggs and then that allows their larva to develop and so for and some amphibian species they have adapted to vernal pools specifically for this um, phase of their life cycle and so for these vernal pool adapted amphibian species individuals must um, time their arrival to these um, water resources very carefully to coincide somewhat with rain events so that they arrive there um, after the water has inundated these vernal pools so that they can actually um, begin breeding and lay their eggs and then their larva can begin to develop. Um, so because of the ephemeral nature of vernal pools, there's a lot of pressure on amphibian larvae to develop fast enough to be able to achieve metamorphosis prior to the, to the pond drying. Um, so this is a specific adaptation that endemic and native species have evolved to, um, to use um, these seasonal water sources. And the nice thing about that is that it kind of helps um, uh, prevent the establishment of non-native species like bullfrogs or introduced fish that aren't adapted to this seasonal wetland. And so for the amphibian species that use vernal pools specifically for their um, breeding they are known as vernal pool specialist species. And so uh, one of those species um, is the California tiger salamander um, or CTS, um, Ambistoma californiense, which is gonna be my main focus um, as far as um, vernal pool amphibians go, because that's what I've researched um, for the past uh, two, three, four years. Um, at Sonoma State. Um, but in addition to that, the Pacific chorus frog is another amphibian species that uses vernal pools successfully, although it's not a vernal pool specialist species. It's more of a generalist and it can kind of use any aquatic resource that it can find. And occasionally Western toads will use vernal pools. And then, um, so those are all our Sonoma County amphibians that could potentially use vernal pools. And I just wanted to mention the Western space the Western Spadefoot, which is another um, species of amphibian that's known as a vernal pool specialist species um, that doesn't occur in Sonoma County, but it's kind of like an iconic vernal pool um, specialist species that you can find in Central California and, and in the valleys and things like that. <clears throat> So I'm gonna talk about the CTS kind of life history overall. So they're um, somewhat explosive breeders, meaning that when the environmental conditions are right, they emerge from their terrestrial habitat, um, typically coinciding with rain events, and they migrate all the way to um, these different vernal pools where they come to breed. And they actually can move pretty significant distances as far as amphibians go to get to these ponds. And typically um, the males are going to arrive first and then the females will arrive shortly after and they'll be able to breed and lay eggs on the different emergent vegetation in the ponds. And uh, typically the, the eggs are, that the females lay are going to be in single, um, deposited singly rather than like a large egg mass from a frog. And those will develop for roughly two to four weeks depending on the temperature and a single female can actually lay um, hundreds of eggs on average about 800, but upwards to 1400 eggs. So there's quite a lot of eggs in these vernal pools um, just from a single female, which is pretty impressive. So um, once the eggs do hatch, then we get our um, tiger salamander larva. So the tiger salamander larva are pretty easy to differentiate from frogs once you know what to look for because um, so you can't you can have tree frog tadpoles in here that look somewhat similar but for the tiger salamander larva they're going to have these large external gills as you can kind of see in these two photos and they're going to be there's three branches and they're kind of large and feathery which allows them to extract the oxygen in the water of the of the pools and while they're in the pools, they're obligate predators. So they're eating anything that they can essentially fit in their mouth because they are gape limited predators, which means they'll just eat um, anything that can fit in their mouth essentially. So this is gonna be primarily macro invertebrates, um, but it can also be um, tadpoles and they will even cannibalize each other if, they, if there's different size cohorts in the pond. So it's definitely um, 
a survival of the fittest in this kind of situation. So once they get big enough and they grow roughly about a millimeter a day, um, they will actually become the top predator in these vernal pool ecosystems because they're typically going to be the largest um, critter in these, in these pools. And so they develop in these pools, they're eating a bunch and it takes a roughly around three to six months. And so this is a really crucial stage of their life cycle because they need to get as big as they can um, to successfully metamorphose as a large, um, preferably a larger um, individual so that that can um, kind of help sustain them as they make that um, transition into the upland environment. And so this next um, slide is just showing some of the different stages of their life cycle. So this first photo is showing some of the eggs that I've seen at my research site. So as you can see, they're all kind of single, singly laid eggs and you can see all the individual embryos. And in this picture, they're still pretty rounded. So these are like probably very recently laid eggs. And then they continue to develop until you start to see some elongation of the embryo. So in this next photo, you can see how they're starting to kind of look like a tadpole or a salamander larva. And um, eventually they're going to hatch and then you'll get these, um, the iconic salamander larva with the external gills. And then they're of course eating and eating and eating so that they can get bigger and potentially, or ideally reach that, um, size that will allow them to metamorphose somewhere around 100 millimeters roughly until you get one of these guys, um, which is what we call a metamorph, which is just a newly transitioned um, tiger salamander larva that doesn't necessarily have those iconic kind of yellow spots yet, but they will develop those over time um, as they uh, reach um, sexual maturity. And so um, after metamorphosing, the salamanders will begin to disperse into the upland. So um, the majority of the time when these salamanders aren't at the vernal pools, they're in the upland environment. Typically they're found in small mammal burrows, things like pocket gopher bur burrows or ground squirrels uh, burrows, um, but they'll just go Ideally though, as metamorphs, they're gonna go wherever they can immediately because they're typically leaving the ponds during a warmer part of the year. And so it's really important for them to find some sort of cover so that they don't desiccate out because they are amphibians with semi-permeable skin. So it's really important that they have, they maintain some moisture. So sometimes you'll find them in soil crevices or under logs near ponds, but they slowly disperse away from these vernal pools. And um, they don't return to the vernal pools until they reach sexual maturity, typically. So that's gonna take roughly two to four years and it varies by individual. Um, and it just depends on you know, that individual's development and their genetics. And so um, over time, they're going to develop those iconic yellow spots. And each individual actually has a unique spot pattern. Um, that allows for individual identification. So in this bottom right photo, I actually am showing the um, ventral side of a salamander. So they even have spots on like their tummy. And so that allows like a second layer of identification um, through the use of their spots. So um, in general, tiger salamanders are important because they are an amphibian. So amphibians are um, what we call an indicator species. So they tell us um, their, their presence or absence is an indication of the health of the environment because they're so sensitive to environment, environmental contaminants. And so in areas where we have created wetlands or potentially runoff from adjacent land uses, the presence of an amphibian or the absence can tell us how um, healthy that community or ecosystem is. And then in addition to that, of course, they have an important role in the food web where they're helping regulate invertebrate communities. And then they also, because of their biphasic life cycle, where they're going from a pool to the upland, they're helping transfer nutrients and energy between those two environments. And so um, because they're important, we wanna know more about them and they are an endangered species. So in Sonoma County, 
we actually have a distinct population segment of these of these salamanders that are uh, genetically and geographically isolated from the rest of the range in California. And um, there are several preserves that have been established um, to try to um, conserve this species and then also conserve vernal pools and um, different um, endangered vernal pool plants. And so one of those preserves is Alton Preserve. And this is where I've been doing the majority of my, or all of my research for the past um, two years um, and four years, if you consider my volunteer work as an undergrad. And so I've been working with um, Dr. Derek German at Sonoma State and then um, Sonoma County Water Agency biologist, Dave Cook, um, who's been studying tiger salamanders for the past two decades. And we've been looking at um, the movement patterns of this specific population at Alton Preserve, where um, there is a high density of vernal pools. So if you look at this map on the right, you can see there's a ton of different pools and each one of those numbers represents a different pool. And so there's in total roughly 56 pools at Alton Preserve and most of them are actually reconstructed um, vernal pools. And this is um, a very successful population despite that and is actually one of the few um, populations in Santa Rosa that we know of that's actually been increasing over time. And so one of my, some of my main kind of hypotheses and questions are regarding the movement patterns of adults in this um, context of a, of a cluster of vernal pools. So I'm wondering how are adults um, visiting these pools? Are they visiting multiple pools within a single season? And then when they do reach these pools, are they returning to the same general um, terrestrial environment that they entered the pools from? So what, how much directionality are they able to exhibit? And then looking at the um, influence of surrounding land uses on the distribution of our captures at some of these pools. And so the way that we're able to answer some of these questions is by using pitfall and drift fence arrays. So these are this is a trapping system where we have um, traps and, and fencing installed encircling the entire perimeter of these pools. And that allows us to capture salamanders as they're entering the pools and then as they're trying to exit the pools. And then we can get the salamanders in hand and take basic morphological data, um, record sex, um, weight, how big are they? And um, we also take um, small tail clips so that we can differentiate between marked individuals versus recaptured individuals. So it is a mark recapture study. And that in combination with photographs that I take of their um, spot patterns allows me to identify unique individuals and then track their locations throughout the breeding season. So I'm using all this information to um, try to answer some of those questions. And then um, I'm, I'm almost done. So I'm hoping to publish something that will answer these questions and um, help us learn more about the, the tiger salamander. And so now Candace is gonna keep talking about vernal pool conservation and where to see vernal pools. There, uh -huh. thank you very much. Um, so uh, some of the current projects that are going on right now that I'm aware of regarding um, vernal pool plants is the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation um, have a, in, in conjunction with like the California Fish and Game and US Fish and Wildlife Service have gotten permits for this work to work with endangered plants. Um, they're doing what they're calling a seed bulking project. So they collect seeds. Uh, from certain sites that have Sebastopol palmetto Metafoam and Berks Goldfields. They're bringing them back to the Laguna Foundation and growing them up in greenhouses and hoop, and hoop house. And then once those plants reach maturity, they harvest the seeds and, with the, um, and return them to areas where populations have been going down over time in, to um, help boost the population. And as you can see from this picture right here, this uh, Sebastopol Meadow foam patch is really flourishing thanks to their efforts. Um, they also sometimes host work days where they're, they rake uh, dead grass out of the way. Sometimes invasive annual grasses can really build up um, uh, some thatch that can, um, if it's not removed, if there's no grazers or it's not removed, uh, it can kind of 
may be a barrier for seedlings to make it past a certain stage. And so they've um, experimented with raking away the thatch and that has helped seedling success too. So keep an eye out for some of their work. Sometimes they have work days or tours where you can learn more about them. And you probably might be interested in going and seeing some vernal pools yourself. Um, a lot of them are on private land or they're on preserves that are not open to the public. However, there are some places uh, that are open to the public around here. Tomodachi Park in Sebastopol has some vernal pools. Um, it's kind of getting to the end of the season right now where things might that are flowering might be going to seed. Uh, the real prime time is like late March through April is the time to go to see the most flowers. Uh, Youth Community Park, which is across the street from Piner High School. There's some open land sort of behind or to the west of the skate where the skate park is. Uh, if you go up closer to Piner Road, there's some pools that have Sonoma Sunshine in them. The Earl Baum Center in Santa Rosa has a walking path around their land that has some uh, vernal pools at it. And they, um, the Earl Baum Center is a nonprofit that helps people that are blind and visually impaired with like activities of daily living. And they created uh, with Laguna Foundation together these um, informational posts at different spots. So if you have like a certain app on your phone, there's like different uh, Bluetooth transponders. As you go to the different spots, it'll narrate a little bit about what's at that place. And so it's like a nature walk where you can learn about it. Um, you don't have to read a sign, you can listen. And then um, Sonoma Valley, it's not in Santa Rosa Plain, but Sonoma Valley Regional Park has some vernal pools and they have a population of Sonoma Sunshine there too. If you wanna go on a guided hike with docents, um, I don't really know of any on a recurring basis in the Santa Rosa area, but there are some really nice ones um, in Central Valley, Central Valley has some really large vernal pools compared to the ones in Santa Rosa. Mather Field in Sacramento has um, a large environmental education organization called Sacramento Splash. They have public tours. They also have a field trip program for fifth and fourth graders to come learn about vernal pools. And they have a really great website with a lot of educational resources. And the Jepson Prairie Preserve, which is outside of the town of Dixon off of Highway 80, um, also has docent led tours. Uh, Jepson Prairie is where Robin Thorpe did a lot of his research and um, they're hosted by the Solano Land Trust. You can go there unguided, uh, but they also have some docent led tours too. So thank you. And... <laughs> uh. Victoria and Candice, thank you so much um, for this presentation and for attendees to know that uh, we're going to start a question and answer session. So uh, we have a number of questions in our um, Q&A, the session. Um, and so we're going to get to those very shortly. But before some of you may stay for that, some of you may leave, um, we'd like you to keep engaged with the Land Trust by following our various social media accounts or visiting our website, the SonomaLandTrust.org. Um, you, can you can view past presentations and download educational material on our Nature at Home page. And that's at sonomalandtrust.org slash nature dash at dash home. I'll drop that in the chat in a minute. And you can keep track of our monthly language of the land webinars. The Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. If you like what you heard today, please consider donating. Your gifts help support land protection and preservation. To make a donation online to the Sonoma Land Trust, please visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. And thank you so much. In these uncertain times, we appreciate everyone who is supporting our work. Okay, so we will now go to the question and answer session. Um, some of them are duplicates, so I will group some of the questions together. Um, and, but before, to get started, Candace, um, you talked about many of the bees you mentioned tonight. Um, are many of them in decline or are they stable populations? Uh, that's something we really don't have the answer to because knowing if they're a decline means you have a baseline and you have continuous data monitoring. <laughs> and so I collected data for about three years 
And I've, you know, gone back and like done some observations, but um, I don't know. I think there's good years and bad years because the differing rain patterns or temperature, a lot of flowers or not so many, you know? So I think it can vary depending upon the year. And so it's hard to know without a good baseline. Victoria, why tiger saddlebatters? Why did you pick them as your study subject? Uh, that's a good question. I, I originally wanted to study Western pond turtles, and then I wanted to study snakes. But um, as an undergrad, I volunteered on a variety of different um, herpetofauna uh, projects. And one of the last ones before I graduated with my undergrad ended up being a tiger salamander um, project by a previous graduate student, Ryan Lewis. Um, and I was out there a lot, <laughs> at least three, three days a week, um, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and it was a really cool field experience. And I ended up just kind of sticking around. And now I'm just in love with amphibians. And I mean, that's pretty much my whole life lately. Even on weekends, I'm looking for different species of salamander just for fun. Um, and they're really important part of the ecosystem. And I've always been interested in um, contributing to conservation in general. So it's nice to be able to try to learn more about them and potentially positively influence this unique population in Sonoma County. Okay. So I'm gonna throw a few questions out there because um, I'm not sure which one of you is the best one to pass them on to, but several questions came up around a construction of vernal pools on private property and people trying to figure out how they can do that. Um, can they obtain credits for construction of vernal pools? Is there any kind of thought there? Uh, well, I am not super up to speed on all the requirements to do that, but I do know that it is a pretty involved process, including permitting um, mm -hmm. because of uh, it's wetlands. So you would want to get the um, Sonoma County PRMD involved and maybe the US Army Corps of Engineers. And then for the plants, there's different agencies. So <laughs> uh, a good person to ask about that would be, there's a consultant who creates vernal pools. His name is Larry Stromberg. He created a lot of the vernal pools um, sites that I monitored. And then also Sarah Gordon, who works at the Laguna Foundation, um, has done a lot of monitoring um, for uh, that. So she probably is familiar with that too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I'm digging through questions. Um, so uh, there's a question about what happens to the bees in the vernal pool if the plant flowers early or later than their normal or average flowering date. Yeah, that's that's definitely a concern um, because they're so you know tight. Their life cycles are dependent on each other. Um, there's a concern that if they get out of sync, that one or the other could could decline a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, like I said, there's changes from year to year. And so hopefully some of the good years make up for some of the bad years. I felt horribly guilty when my pan traps collected so many uh, bees. And one thing that Robin told me that helped reassure me was like, he's like, well, each one of these probably already replaced itself, if not, you know, provisioned at least five to 10 nest cells already before you collected it. So, you know, there's a chance for... <laughs> for it to be replaced in the next year generation so okay. but yeah hopefully those relationships can you know not break down in the face of like climate change and changing weather and stuff like that hopefully they stay intact mm -hmm. but it is a concern and, and speaking of kind of those concerns um you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people will try to kill mosquitoes um no one really enjoys mm -hmm. mosquitoes is, is there a danger from um killing mosquitoes to uh, the vernal pool ecosystem? Uh, yeah, well, that, that's a big concern too, because these uh, ephemeral wetlands evolved without fish in them, you know, because they're not, there's not water, the whole part of the air fish cannot survive there. And so when like vector control district drops off mosquito fish, that's a different predator that's introduced to the system. And so um, in general, I would think with all the different aquatic invertebrates that are in the vernal pools, um, mosquitoes would not be like the biggest population boom. And, you know, 
there i would guess there's like predator and prey balance somewhere mm -hmm. and it's more like the sta the stagnant standing buckets of water and stuff that do them but yeah that would be something to be concerned about like spraying or dropping off mosquito fish where there normally aren't fish that could sort of disrupt the ecology also Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that mosquito fish can be detrimental to tiger salamanders um, because they're not, you know, typically occurring in an area where there's supposed to be fish. And I am at least at my field site where we have lots of different vernal pools, we didn't really have a huge issue with mosquitoes. Like I wasn't like suffering the whole time when I was collecting my data from mosquitoes. And I'm assuming that that's probably in part because we have such a healthy population of tiger salamanders that kind of help regulate um, some of the invertebrate populations, such as mosquitoes. Now, our, uh, we have a question from um, a viewer regarding spotted salamanders. Are those the same as the tiger salamander, or is that something different? Um, I'm not, there is an East Coast species of, that's called, the common name is a spotted salamander, and they are um, in the same genus, Ambistoma, and they also use vernal pools, um, or actually, I actually, I take that back. I'm not sure if they use vernal pools, but they are on the East Coast um, and they look very similar to tiger salamanders, right. um, but they're only on the East Coast. Okay, so then it's, maybe there's just referring to the tiger salamanders. So it is, is it a threatened species where you're not able to do certain things to your property around tiger salamanders? Oh yeah, it's it's a huge nuisance in a way to um, people who want to build like on their property. Um, and it's definitely something that construction has to constantly deal with. Um, you need to have permanent biologists um, survey the area prior to a lot of construction projects in Sonoma County and within the other um, segments of their population. So in Central California, there's another distinct population segment and also in Santa Barbara. Um, and so um, that's part of what I do with the company that I work for is we will survey areas for potential um, tiger salamanders and then we will also stay on construction sites that have to um, do some sort of, you know, work for PG&E or Caltrans or whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. And if they're digging, we're there watching the whole time in case something gets dug up. Um, but even on private property, you do need to get permits um, to do certain activities um, if you're within the range of the tiger salamander because they're so um, threatened and endangered in Sonoma County. And, and so one of the questions actually from one of our viewers is they have a, an HOA that is uh, likely constructing uh, vernal pools and it seems like there may be a need of professional uh, attention and guidance. Do you either of you do visitation or consulting around uh, the construction of vernal pools? No, I don't. <laughs> but um, some names I would recommend and you could maybe email me after. Uh, I know Larry Stromberg is really great with constructing vernal pools. There's also a consultant named Stephen Talley, who has worked a lot in the San Jose area. Uh, Sarah Gordon would probably know too from Laguna Foundation. Okay. Um, would you be willing to release your contact information to our viewers? If you could drop that in the chat, if you'd sure. be willing to do that. Um, and while you're doing that, let me check through some questions. Um, questions. Uh, ah, um, is it accurate to say that the oligo bees only eat the one plant or prefer that plant? Are they very well, plant specific? I think they, in terms of collecting pollen for their nest provisions, they like to collect from specific plants, but when it comes to drinking nectar, they will go to other plants to drink nectar. Mm -hmm. and, and going back to the tiger salamander, um, I know there was a list of a lot of preserves that are in uh, Sonoma County area. Um, is that a, a, a map that people can access anywhere? And the other question was, where exactly is the Alton Preserve? Um, so in general, these preserves are all private. Um, the Alton Preserve is actually a privately owned mitigation bank. Um, so it's not open to the public. It is generally located in Northwest Santa Rosa, um, but I tend to not um, share direct locations of some of these areas just to be careful because they are 
because of their endangered status, um, it's you're not supposed to be handling the species or anything like that. Um, so yeah, there's there's a couple different preserves. I think there's eight in total that I that the um, biologists that I work with, Dave Cook, monitors, and then there's additional preserves that exist um, through um, CDFW that they manage. Um, and I don't know the exact locations for all of those, but for um, the ones that I help out with, there's there's eight of them throughout Santa Rosa. Okay. Um, and here's kind of a, a question, not so much about either the, the bees or the salamander, but how do the shrimp get into the pools? Um, I think mostly they're spores or they're, they're cysts, they're dried eggs. Uh, are in the dust or in the, in the bottom of the vernal pools, just desiccated. They're adapted to be dried out and just be waiting until the rain comes again. Hmm. And also there's, there's been some um, theories and you know, hypotheses about um, waterfowl, like, fly, like ducks and geese and um, killdeers, you know, come go between vernal pools and carrying things with them or like eating them and then pooping them out other places so mm -hmm. that could be a source of movement you know of different you know um invertebrates cysts and seeds you know going from place to place too okay one of our attendees um works with children in um nature education was wondering if they're exploring vernal pools with children, are there any insects or otherwise things that they should um, watch out for for safety reasons around vernal pools? Well, predaceous diving beetles have some strong jaws, so <laughs> I would watch out for that. I mean, uh, one thing to do instead of like grabbing things directly, you can use like an aquarium net to you know dip water, and I think some some vernal pools might be protected like they don't want you dipping in if there's salamanders there but other ones you can you know just aquatic exploring aquatic life dip them in and dump it out in, either into like a white ice cube tray or a frisbee that's uh put upside down so and with some water so you can see them kind of more spread out on a background and then mm -hmm. you can like observe them before putting them back again but for sure you should not be handling the salamanders correct Definitely not. Um, the only circumstance that you would be okay to be doing that is if you were with someone directly who is permitted. So I do train like lots of different volunteers on my project to help me process all the salamanders because otherwise I would never get anything done. Because it, it would like this past winter, for example, we caught um, almost 1300 salamanders. And so I had a wide array of different volunteers coming out that were helping me process each individual salamander because you have to measure them and um, weigh them, sex them, photograph them. So we were out there for really long days um, and it, it wouldn't have been possible without having different volunteers from all sorts of different backgrounds and from all over the state too. So if you're with someone permitted, then, then that's okay. But otherwise you want to, you know, leave them alone because they are, you know, struggling to survive. So we don't want to like negatively impact them on accident. Mm -hmm. And um, are there, you know, um, tiger salamanders in Napa County, what kind of is their range? I know you both work in Sonoma County, but how big of a range outside of Sonoma County is the tiger salamander? So the, the Sonoma County range, um, it's, you know, Santa Rosa, primarily, and it extends um, into like the northern boundary of the Petaluma watershed, but it doesn't extend east into Napa, um, really. But that's just the Sonoma County um, distinct population. But then in the Central Valley, there's like a much wider range um, in that area. And that's the largest distinct population segment. And then the third one is the Santa Barbara one, which is also pretty much just restricted to that county for the most part. So, so the, is there a Napa population or is just the, the central, so there's not a Napa population? Yeah, okay. it's just those three. Um, and um, yeah, they're all kind of geographically isolated from one another. Mm -hmm. And um, the other question, uh, uh, Candice, you made a comment about the vector control um, when, with the question about mosquitoes. Um, is, is the are they, is vector control, as you know it, releasing a number of fish into 
frontal pools or is that just something that's happened in the past? Um, I, I don't know about currently. I do remember one of my advisors complaining about having that happen um, sort of in the Todd Road area. Um, but yeah, I remember her complaining about it. But I don't think it's a common practice, like widespread. I think it's just happened in certain, you know, mm -hmm. there's certain areas like out by Todd Road where there's a lot of like cattle ponds and stuff. And so they might have inadvertently introduced them to vernal pools too. Right. So I live on um, Cooper Road myself. So I'm near the one side of Laguna, but I go through the Todd Road cut through all the time. And there's always, mm -hmm. you know, the, the waiting birds out there eating something. So I'm clearly, I'm guessing they're eating uh, tiger salamanders when they can find them. Um, so oh, there's another question from um, a viewer regarding um, a tiger salamander preserve in the Southwest Santa Rosa area. And have either of you studied uh, vernal pools in that area um, near the Fresno Ave area? Um, possibly. Uh, it's hard to know like exactly <laughs> where that is off the top of my head um but there are like a number of preserves in like kind of the southern edge of Santa Rosa where I've done larval sampling as a volunteer mm -hmm. um and I guess we call we have names for them like horn preserve or hall preserve um but I did they're not like advertised that way so I'd have to look it up but probably <laughs> I think I, that person might be talking about Heratunian preserve which oh. is like where the frontage road makes like the L it's a little bit north of like Walmart, um, you know, at the very uh -huh. border between Runner Park and Santa Rosa. And I went there to for Sonoma Sunshine and there was a lot of Sonoma Sunshine flowers there. It was nice. <laughs> and um, recently um, there were like, I think it was last year, a Laguna Foundation had a work party to clear out blackberries there. So people are still like going and paying attention. And there's like a salamander crossing sign on the fence. I remember oh. when I like walked into the property, there's a salamander crossing sign. But yeah, <laughs> I haven't been back in a while. And in reference to the Todd area, there is a viewer says that um, they had thought that some of the Todd area vernal pools were created by uh, the people in that area. Do, do you know much about those vernal pools and the creation of them? Uh, the very first time I heard about what a vernal pool was, I got brought um, to a place where vernal pools were constructed. And this man who worked on them named Larry Stromberg like led the, the field trip and he had a little whiteboard and he drew like the underlayer and everything. And um, that place where they constructed them is like right by the elbow of Todd Road where it makes that 90 degree ah. turn to the south side of that there's a bunch of constructed vernal pools and those are some of the ones I monitored in my in my study so ah. and then to the north or to the north side of that road is called Todd Road Preserve which is um has, has natural pools so um I got to go there once as part of like a trying to count the flower population there but um that was yeah I wasn't looking for bees there I was mostly south and cows Excellent. on that preserve uh, ate my pan traps. <laughs> <laughs> One of those funny stories. Cows are determined. That is definitely <laughs> true. Um, so Candace, are there any other kind of unique pollinators that people may come across that was kind of outside of your study that they may see along some of the vernal pools? Um, well, one thing I didn't mention today, because I was more focused on the bees that specialize on the flowers, but for uh, Berks Goldfields, there's this little hairy fly. It's a, called a bumblebee fly, bumblebee-like fly. They're kind of like grayish brown, and they have a, like a long pointy proboscis that they use to like kind of almost like a little drill, like suck nectar out of the flowers. And they were actually the most common insect that I saw on gold fields. And something that's like unique about them and kind of intriguing is that they are nest parasites of solitary bees. So they'll lay their eggs on in, into the ground nesting bee nests, and then the eggs will hatch out and eat the pollen ball and the baby larva. Uh -huh. And so in a way it shows, I mean, it's kind of scary because you're like, oh no, not the bees. 
<laughs> but it shows if there's enough of a population of those guys, it shows that its host is, you know, has a good strong population too. So it's kind of this interesting, like, is this a pollinator? Is it an enemy of the other pollinator? Like, how do they all interact? And it would be cool. It's really hard to find the ground nests, um, but it'd be really cool to find them and monitor and watch who's coming and going and stuff like that. So maybe yeah. in a future year, I'll do that. <laughs> all right. Um, well, we have actually worked through all of the questions that I have, let me make sure I've got a couple. Um, so uh, how big does a vernal pool need to be to sustain amphibians? Is there a certain size minimum? Uh, yeah, so in general, you want um, the depth to be at least 40 centimeters. So anything like below 20 centimeters isn't really gonna sustain a long enough hydro period for salamanders to lay in there. And a lot of the research recently, at least um, that I've come across has been showing that one of the best things for tiger salamanders is having multiple different pools at varying depths within an area. And that is um, seems to be directly um, correlated with um, more recruitment of larval individuals um, because you have more um, you have like a higher number of uh, breeding ponds for them to choose from that are going to have variation in hydro period. Whereas if you have a bunch of shallow ponds, it's, they're probably not going to be sustained long enough for this larva to reach metamorphosis. Um, so you want the pools to be deep enough for them to hold water, but not so deep that they maintain water too much. Um, because although they are in, in other areas, like in central California, there are um, quite a few stock ponds that and um, different perennial water sources that have been um, created that tiger salamanders are taking advantage of down there. So it's it, it, they can use them. Um, it's just the there is the concern of potentially bullfrogs or fish populations getting established, and then they will predate on the CTS, and then that could be an issue. Um, so it's it's kind of just trying to walk that that line between um, you know perennial and ephemeral. Um, water sources and then, you know, invaders. Okay. So we have worked through all of the questions. So uh, Candice and Victoria, is there any kind of last message you would like to leave our viewers with regarding uh, vernal pools or the pollinators or the, the tiger salamanders? Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming and listening to us and having your love of the land and your curiosity and all your wonderful questions. And uh, I'm, it's wonderful to be in the company of people who love nature. So thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my research and talk about tiger salamanders um, among people who are actually interested in tiger salamanders because I can only talk about them so much with my friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Victoria and Kenneth, thank you so much. Um, and Miranda, thank you for doing the interpreting over on um, uh, the other site for us. Um, this has been a great evening. I would like to thank all of those who attended and hopefully um, you will catch some of our future uh, language of the lands. Um, thank you all and have a good night.